Thank you for listening to the Plain State Podcast, a production of the Department of English at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. In this episode, Corey Willard meets with some of his students to discuss their experience in English 317, Literature and the Environment, which took place in the field in western Nebraska. Uh, hello, my name is Corey Willard. I'm a fifth-year PhD candidate here at the English Department uh, at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I have a couple students with me today. We're going to be talking about uh, literature and the environment broadly, and more specifically about uh, English 317 literature and the environment at Cedar Point Biological Station, uh, which is a class that occurs in the summer pre-session during the second half of May each year. Uh, the course is worth three ACE 5 credits. Um, English 317, Literature and the Environment, uh, asks students to explore their relationship with nature, our socioeconomic relationship with the natural world, and literature's relationship to the environment. What makes the Cedar Point version of the course unique is that not only is it a study of literature and the environment, but that it is actually a two-week immersive field course where students and instructors stay at Cedar Point Biological Station on the shores of Lake Ogallala. Um, over the two weeks, students do things like keep nature journals, go on field trips, have classroom discussions, and read a lot on the topic of literature and the environment to better understand how place, literature, and their own lives and perspectives are intertwined. Uh, so today I'm joined by uh, Ben and Karina, if the two of you want to introduce yourselves. I'm Karina Olivetti. I'm an environmental studies major, and I'm kind of into the natural resources, climate change, and sustainability aspects of that major. And I'm Ben Kirchner. I'm an English major, and I took the class mostly for fun, actually. All right, so um, first off, I'm interested in how, how did the two of you find out about the class in the first place, and what compelled you to, to take such a course? I was sitting at Hardin Hall studying, and there was a flyer on one of the tables, and it just looked interesting. And I was looking at the books. There was like pictures of the books. And I was like, oh, this looks cool. And then later on that day, I Googled Cedar Point and then I got really into it. I was just uh, looking for a summer class to take because I wanted to take it easy my senior year. And I scrolling through the summer classes, this looked like the, the most fun. And also two weeks for a three credit class. That's crazy. So that would be fun. Anyways. So true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this class is very different in that it's a field course, you know, out at a research station, four hours west of Lincoln. That's not something we probably typically think of when we think of a literature course. Um, so what were your expectations going in? Were you excited, worried about where you're getting yourselves into? I think the only expectation I had in the beginning was to get my ACE 5 taken care of. Um, and then I, I'm an avid reader, so that was like one of the only other expectations was to read for credit. Mm. Yeah, I, I really had no real expectations. I didn't look up the Cedar Point Center beforehand, so I kind of drove in. I was a little intimidated at first, but basically after the first day, it was, it, it was very routine and just lots of reading and hiking. It was a good time. Yeah, so um, I was wondering if maybe the, the two of you could talk a little bit about what you you would say the overall experience is like um, going out to Cedar Point and, and taking a course there. For me, uh, I was a little nervous going in. Like Ben said, it was intimidating, just like parking and then walking into this unknown. Um, but the experience was like awesome. The the cabin setting, it was like a summer camp and my cabin mates happen to be really cool. And so I formed some friendships there. We're still like chatting and keeping up with each other. Um, the hiking trails were awesome. Just being in nature the whole time while like reading and like immersing in this literature and the environmental aspects of the literature. It was it was a great experience for me. Yeah, and I, I really love just uh, waking up. We actually spent a little bit of time with the ornithology class uh, when they were doing their netting and banding, and I thought that was great because in addition to the obviously like wake up, hike, read, hike, go to class, repeat, uh, 
that aspect was really cool, but also getting to kind of sit in and do stuff with the other classes who are working with the environment was a good time. That was cool. Like, it felt like we almost had a class and a half with that ornithology class going on and holding the birds mm. and seeing those every day was awesome. Do you think there are, are uh, any distinct advantages um, to taking a course like this at Cedar Point rather than on city campus? Do you, uh, outside, I guess, of it just being fun, you know, being in cabins and getting a hike? if you're into that sort of thing, um, in terms of, of your learning and your engagement um, with literature, um, did, you, did you find that there were any advantages being out there? The advantage for me was being like immersed in the literature. We would read uh, like one book one day, and then it seemed like the next day I would actually experience what I had just read. So it was different than taking just a English class, a, a literature class where you're just in a classroom. And then talking about it, this was like reading it, talking about it, and then feeling it. So it was like this total immersion for me with the literature and the environment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's really special to read books written about a certain place when you're actually in that place. Uh, I know in, in Keith County Journal, uh, he, he mentions uh, Ollie's Big Game Lodge, and we actually got to go there. So the... It's it's very different than Lincoln and getting to experience the place that the literature is written about is, I think, an important part of learning about that. Yeah. And like like Ben saying with Keith County Journal, um, he writes about is that the one where he writes about the bridges, certain bridges? Yes. Yes. Um, and then so we read about all these bridges. And then I think a couple days later, we traveled to each of those bridges on our way to all these big game bars. So that for me was impactful to see the swallows and just some other things that he had written about. Mm. Yeah, so you get to you know, live the literature. Exactly. Like, you know, like, kind of walk inside the covers of the books. Uh, if you had to pick maybe like one or two things um, from the experience, whether it's from, you know, maybe one thing from just the experience of being out there and maybe one thing from our readings that most uh, most stuck with you sort of after we left Cedar Point. Uh, what might they be? Well, one of a really special moment was actually with Ben and him and I after dinner one um, evening. We were walking the trail to see the great horned owl nest. And uh, the owl was on the outside of the nest that night. And locking eyes with that was it was like... I don't know. I can't even describe what it felt like because it was so intense. Yeah, no, that that was actually uh, a crazy experience. So owls, as I think most people know, can basically always see you if you're within range. Uh, and when you look at them through binoculars, it's it's like they really are just staring directly like through the binocular into you. So it's that was a really intense experience. I just got goosebumps thinking about it again. I was thinking, <laughs> that was an awesome moment. There were so many moments, it's hard to even like pick which ones, with as far as the nature and things, because we experienced so much. Um, with the literature, I think for me, the Lauren Isley's The Immense Journey, there were so many um, lines in that book that I had to write down. I, I wrote some on my cabin walls, like... That book was just like very impactful for me. Mm. I I was personally a, a huge fan of Buffalo for the Broken Heart. Uh, very entertaining, especially given it's 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 nonfiction, but it's still it, it reads like a like a fiction book, and it's just very entertaining. I agree with that. All right, so um, our class sort of took on a, a bit of a mantra. Um, based on a Lawrence Buell quote, uh, there never was an is without a where. What does that quote mean to you? Well, to me, it sort of means like looking at, at a place more intricately and not just the physical aspects, but the emotional and sort of uh, feelings that you get in that place. Um like, I'm from the Great Plains, but I'd never really thought about the 
the Great Plains as like what its meaning was and just how much life depended on the Great Plains. So I guess just putting more into an actual place, not just being like, well, I'm here. I saw that, you know, just more of a feeling, I guess. Mm. I, I think it's really important. Like place affects everybody. No one would be the same person if they grew up in a different kind of situation and getting to put individual aspects of place into context like we we spent time talking about like termites and and grass and really that's not an exciting thing outside of the context of the place that relies on them so it's yeah all right so uh since we had our class sort of Discussions around climate change have really become sort of omnipresent online and in the news and sort of everywhere. Uh, I don't think when, when our class was held that Lincoln had uh, a climate strike or march of any kind yet. Um, now, sort of various groups in the city have organized um, several of them. Um, do you think reading and writing can play a role in how we might think and do things differently? I think that was one of the coolest things about the class. Um, it sort of gave me a different idea of what I could do with my major even, and just how impactful literature can be for environmental issues, and just bringing awareness to things that some people would never hear of unless they would read this book or, say, article. Um, so, yeah, I think literature can do a lot. It's powerful. Yeah, and I think the best way to learn about anything really is to read and write about it and be immersed in it and to see it. So it's really hard to to talk about like creeks drying up in Kansas and, and things like that without actually getting to to see what has changed and what people are doing to uh, to fix it. The other thing about the class was like, the lectures and the the discussions we had, you kind of like for me, I got to see and hear like different perspectives from because we all had different backgrounds um, academically. So just listening to other perspectives, I think, helped me just see where other people might be coming from on the issues of climate change and natural resource degradation and things like that. All right, so. Carrying on with that, I'm sort of interested in what you think um, perhaps the, the role or responsibility of the writer can or should be in our current moment of environmental crises on many fronts. The role, um, the most important thing I think for a writer right now is to write in a way that's accessible to all people, not just a scientific community. Um, Dealing it, dealing with it to make people care, like on a personal level, trying to find those things that can weave us together instead of just spewing out a bunch of scientific facts. Um, I think that's how how change is going to happen quicker. Mm. I, I think it's tough for a writer to push an environmental issue in in fiction or even nonfiction other than the essay form. But so obviously the the most persuasive way to speak to people uh, would be to talk directly about the issues if people actually wanted to hear things like that. But sort of disguising uh, entertainment or disguising environmental awareness as entertainment, I think, is a really great way to uh, trick people into caring about the world. <laughs> And that's kind of what uh, Dan does in the Buffalo for the Broken Heart. Um, he does kind of add that humor and sort of his personal story. And it does grab you and, and make you care, even though he is giving it straight up like these are the issues. Uh, yeah, I mean, I something that I think on this issue, I mean, if uh, things like climate change or you know, plastic pollution were going to be solved by science or even just a general awareness that they exist, they would have been solved already. 
Um, we know the answers. We know what we need to do. These are largely cultural problems. Um, and so it's interesting to hear the two of you talk about how uh, sort of like that pathos, that emotional um, appeal that maybe things like literature or um, whether that's, you know, nonfiction or fiction or even poetry or, you know, film, art, um, the way these things can maybe like speak to us or sort of find a roundabout way to have people sort of take in those scientific, that scientific information they might um, otherwise resist. That was kind of like another thing I thought of when you showed that video of the, um, oh man, I can't remember the bird, but that was intense. That video with all the plastic they pull out of the, the albatross, I think. Yeah, midway. Yeah. So visual arts are also a really good way to approach these environmental issues, in my opinion. All right. So one of the activities you had to do uh, for the class was to Keep a daily nature journal. Um, for instance, uh, Micah, who unfortunately couldn't make it, um, her nature journal sort of consistently kept referring to this idea that uh, a weed is not a botanical classification. Um, that was something that sort of blew her mind, that a weed is actually a, a cultural definition. Um, in many cases, what we think of as a weed are the native plants of an area. Um, and so what was the experience like for you um, to go sort of day by day and do these journal entries? I was always really surprised by the diversity. When, when I was doing my journal, I was sort of looking for specific things to write about. And eventually it got to a point where I realized that everything around me was really easy to write about. So I kind of started like looking for lizards under log piles to little success <laughs> uh, found no snakes like couldn't uh, couldn't find that sort of life but eventually noticing patterns in in trees or unique landmarks of the way that uh, cacti are situated on on the hills behind the cedar point it's it becomes really easy to to write about that sort of thing if you're spending your entire day doing it so I love doing the journal. Um, I would usually go to the same place every time, at least in the morning. Um, so it was it was like an activity too. I would you know walk out to this ledge and sit and write. Um, and a lot of my journal entries weren't that great, but it was easy to write because there's all these sounds or silence going on. So your thoughts come come pretty quickly um and you're you're kind of unconnected from technology out at cedar point which i thought was very refreshing and i that that aspect of it was great yeah so i actually reread your nature journals you know sort of in preparation for this podcast and you know get myself full of you know all sorts of feels and whatnot again um and so one of the things uh I noticed is that sort of um, that experience might seem a little laborious at first. Uh, again, sort of to echo what you said, Ben, um, you're sort of just trying to like, I know I have to write a nature journal, so I have to find something to write a nature journal about. Uh, did you find that sort of over time, you just sort of started seeing the types of things, you know, around you day to day that we were actually reading about? Yeah, things definitely were popping out, even just tiny little plants um, that I probably wouldn't have noticed before seemed like they were vibrating almost. And the bird bird sounds, especially with the ornithology class going on, I was very curious at all of the, the bird sounds and flight that I was experiencing. Yeah, and well, with the birds, it was so interesting since Cedar Point is so varied in, in its life. Uh, you would hear different kinds of bird calls depending on where you were in the uh, in the place. So every time I crossed uh, the bridge to to my cabin, uh, I heard the same bird do the same song every single time I got on that bridge. But it was always uh, a whole bunch of different sounds when when I was on trails. So it was yeah, it was really incredible. I think the literature did help sort of 
start to notice more than if if you if we hadn't have been reading the literature. I don't know if I would have just been more in my head or what it would have been like, but I think the literature did spark a lot of curiosity with what was around. Hmm. And it really puts the the place into context. Yeah. Very accessible to experience, but you still get to see it through your own mind. It just in a more educated way. Yeah. And so, for instance, you mentioned um, going to Ollie's, which is in Keith County Journal, uh, which is written about the county where Cedar Point is. It's in Keith County. Uh, we also um, read The Last Prairie uh, by Stephen Jones, which is sort of all about Crescent Lake National Wildlife Refuge, or at least features in it pretty prominently. Uh, what was it like to actually read that book and then go out there? I mean, it was sort of the trip we talked about the whole time. It rained a lot when we were out there. We weren't going to be able to make it. Had to drive through some, you know, water and things like that and we'll drive <laughs> to get there. But we did. Um, so it was an experience like like that to go out and just see uh, all this open prairie and, you know, all the things you can experience there. Um, after, you know, sort of specifically reading a book that was so much about that place. It was so cool, especially we w- right when we drove in, we saw those two burrowing owl- owls on the fence posts and and he he writes a lot about the burrowing owls and like when we got to the first lake i could almost just picture him in his little i think he just had a little tent or sleeping bag and i could almost picture where he was Mm. so yeah and the the sky out there is is dizzying the lincoln is is very it's not super light polluted you can see uh the the skyline and it's it's still a flat place but this is this is like perfect flatness the the diversity is is crazy so many different birds and bugs and yeah just like he writes about so well and we also saw some interesting birds while we there we were there was it a willet i think yeah, the... which was cool seeing in the reeds and i think he writes about those in the last prairie he writes a lot about um, what was it, the one that you were out in the field trying to capture the, long, the curlew, the, the, the long billed curlew. Yeah, the long billed <laughs> curlew. And so that was awesome that we actually got to see one after reading about him. Yeah, we saw a number of, of bitterns and I guess, oh yeah, yeah, the bitterns. A, a, a snake vomiting up a salamander and then screaming. <laughs> and the carp, the yeah. carp were really awesome. Uh, his book was especially fun for me. I just I liked how he wove in a lot of Native American um, culture and like mythology or uh, stories into the literature with the birds and everything. So I liked his book a lot. I mean, it's interesting too. He's someone who who lives in Boulder, but for him, the Sand Hills is sort of that that magical, sublime place. And so many people were from this part of the world. They go west to, to Boulder or Denver or, you know, mm. somewhere around there. And they think of that as the the romantic landscape to go to. Yeah, it's a, it's such a unique um, landscape. And if you've never been there, it's it's worth it. And I think everybody should go because it, it is just so vast and you can see so far um, just a totally different landscape than I think you can find in, in a lot of states. And I think uh, we, as sort of an American society, have an idea of what natural beauty is. And that involves like mountains and, and colors and very specific kinds of animals. But people don't think of sand hills as a beautiful natural place. But actually going there, it, it really is. It's just difficult to get people to see that. Yeah, we seem to be sort of trained for a vertical sort of aesthetic. We even think of, you know, the buildings that we think are like impressive or beautiful or, you know, skyscrapers and um, and things like that. And we're trained to you know, see the impressive height of forests or, or mountains. Um, we aren't really sort of visually trained, I don't think, in a lot of, you know, postcards and other media that we see to uh, appreciate that type of, you know, being able to see for miles, being sort of actually like in the middle of of a vastness rather than just in awe of something that's in front of us yeah 
Uh, and so another thing I wanted to, to do um, with this podcast episode is to give you a chance to either share some, some work you did if, if you have it or um, and maybe provide some commentary on it for why you thought you know that was what you'd like to share, how it was insightful, maybe how it, how it connects to that experience out at Cedar Point for you. Okay, well, this was from my essay, and um, my essay was called A Bird's Eye View, A Sense of, My Sense of Place. I think, I forgot to write that down on this paper. So um, I kind of incorporated my journal with the literature, and in some, in some parts of my essay, I had um, quotes from the authors that we were reading, but... So here it goes. As I sit on the backs of rock ledge, my upper half is warmer than my dangling legs. There's a coolness drifting up from below, almost as if my legs were dangling in cool water. So far, this is my favorite place to read and write. The red cedar might not be native, but it sure does cast a good shadow to read within. The birds and cows love them too. Some people get to loving birds through osmosis. Others are attracted to the freedom of flight and migration. My story is a mix of both. In this river beneath the sky, Doreen Foss comes to birds out of personal necessity as she is struggling to accept where she lives. John Janovey Jr. in Keith County Journal, a scientist by trade, looks at birds in an ecological way of interconnectedness. Janavi relates the many mutualistic relationships that all organisms have on Earth, including humans. In The Last Prairie, Jones writes about the sacredness of birds and habitats through Native American stories and his personal adventures. These books, The Bird Banding Experience and My Personal Adventures During This Course, emphasize the necessity to save Great Plains habitat for bird species and the huge diversity of all other organisms that live here. And I guess I just chose this. Um, because I kind of talk about a few of the books and the just how special the birds were for me and learning about the unique migration that goes through this area and how you get a, a mix of eastern and western um, bird species, which I'd never really thought about. There was so much bird knowledge that came at me during this class that I, I think that's why I chose this one. Uh, one thing is, I mean, just from reading your, your nature journals, for instance, I, I just... I came across what sort of seemed to be the moment where you really sort of seemed to be just like getting into the experience and just like letting yourself go. And you just had a really short um, nature journal, which actually didn't meet the minimum requirements. But, you know, I let it I let it slide. And you just wrote, today I released a bird and nothing else mattered. Uh, and so for both of you, clearly, um, you know, uh, uh, the personal experience of being out there was was important. Uh, I'm just, um, and, and both of you can comment on this. So again, Ben, yeah, maybe if you don't want to just, if you don't have any work you want to read, you can just talk about this maybe as a writer and as someone who, who is, is an English major, um, the, the value or, or worth, um, I guess maybe both as a reader and a writer, um, of work that mixes this idea of personal experience with, with research again, stuff that's not purely, uh, just someone narrating their own personal experience, but that's mixing it with stuff that is researched and, you know, has factual, you know, basis to it. And, you know, the way those two things end up working together. Well, I think I wish that Micah was here because she definitely kind of came out the, like even her guided tour for her assignment. I can't remember what the assignment was called, but our guided tours that we did at the end, you could tell that she had already done a lot of research and really got into the sort of farming aspects um, because she is from out there around the same area. So I think for her that that really spurred a whole research um, aspect to this assignment. Whereas for me, um, I had a lot of other things more emotionally tied to it, like the thing with reading my great grandpa's name in one of the books was just like very uh, moving. And so I can't say that I like I had some research through the uh, Paul Johnsgaard. 
I, I think it's really interesting as an English major to read uh, this kind of work and to discuss and really attempt to to emulate it. Uh, one that sticks out to me is uh, Great Plains by Ian Frazier. Uh, bizarre book to read if you're not used to reading uh, <laughs> books about the environment because he mixes in uh, culture and history and place study and it doesn't read like an essay and it doesn't read like nonfiction. And to take things like that and basically just give you a, a cinematic quality to, to what you're reading is is really impressive and it really helped with, with my writing personally. I actually, for a class, I, I wrote a story sort of loosely based on, on the experience there uh, called Road Hawken. <laughs> nice! Uh, but uh, really the the whole point of it is just to, to let people see the place and that story is not great, but the the idea that being able to experience a place through writing is valuable is valuable. <laughs> I kind of forgot about that book, and and you use the term, and I can't it it means layers, but I can't remember. Uh, Palm says. Yeah, and that's how he wrote that book. So at least it seemed like that after I read it. I was like, that makes sense. It's in a layered, not a linear fashion so that was a good book yeah so for anyone who doesn't know palimpsest is how they used to do uh medieval manuscripts where um because they didn't have paper yet they would scrape off what was written on on like a hide before uh and then rewrite over it but there would always be traces of what existed before sort of um still bleeding through under under what was newly written and so this idea of a, a, a palimpsest is often used um, by people who do place place based research, uh, and this idea that there there's you know always sort of these layers of history and culture and ecology and everything sort of going on uh, all at the same time, um, regardless of what seems most immediately uh, present to us. Uh, and so what we've sort of been talking about this this last couple minutes here. Um, actually is is sort of a big turn in in eco criticism which is my my field uh this move toward what a lot of people have called uh narrative scholarship um and it comes out of the idea uh that you know if you're doing work in literature in the environment environment is just a big part of your concern that there there is a certain advocacy or activist sort of streak pretty much in like everyone's work um and so again it's this idea that both of you touched on on earlier that perhaps um, the personal experience, personal narrative, um, these types of creative writing that connect to the more emotional and human side of things, you know, um, can help maybe mobilize people. And so even if we're doing academic research, um, maybe that idea that we should be uh, objective sort of agents divorced from whatever it is we're writing about just doesn't doesn't really hold water anymore. Mm -hmm. um, wondering is is that the the case in at all in environmental studies or are uh, a lot of people you you maybe read or or work with really trying to approach things from a very scientific sort of standpoint? Um, I've kind of been pleasantly surprised that a lot of my professors are talking about the social aspect of where change needs to occur and the behavioral change. So that, that's been good. It's just the how is, I think, the big challenge. How do you get people to change their behavior? And how do you, how do you make positive change? So it's the action part, I think, that's difficult. But yeah, I think I think a lot of my professors are focusing on the social aspect and not just the scientific anymore. Because I think the the narrative aspect is necessary to, to get people to care. Nobody, well, not nobody, but very few people read environmental essays for fun. Uh, and maybe it wasn't like that in the past. But it's difficult, I think, even now to get someone to sit down and read a book even. So to to make something accessible to, to people, I think a story has to be told. And we need to understand how the environment affects us as humans. 
And a lot of my assignments too seem to be about um, creating something to get people to care, like say through a video or working with a Lincoln business on sustainability, things like that, and not necessarily just collecting data and writing scientific papers, but you know, trying to go out into the community and, and maybe get politically active to make changes like that. Cool. So um, I'm currently working on the next edition of this course. Uh, I've actually themed the class around birds in Great Plains literature. You know, we've talked a lot about about birds. I mean, I had been out to Cedar Point before we did this course, so I knew, um, you know, I wanted you to have to get to at least do like bird banding once. Like that was something that I had planned and things like that. But the the sort of ever-present nature of birds and and just doing bird related things observing birds um was something that even like from me on the, the sort of instructor side of the table you know that i was sort of discovering along along with you just how big of a part of the course that ended up being and just how how often birds showed up in all of these books even if birds wasn't sort of why i assigned them or why you know what I was thinking we were going to focus so much of our time talking about. Um, and so uh, you got to ha actually not only see, but handle birds last time. Is that the first time e either of you actually have to like hold and release a bird? I had held birds before, but not in that kind of setting. More like, oh, there's an injured bird or this hummingbird is scared so he can't move. He has to calm his heart down. So I'd held some, but not in the same way. Um, this was, this was different in that you were like holding it and feeling its heartbeat and having those ornithologists like do their, their, um, specific tests that they do. It, it was, it was different. It was really cool. Yeah. This was actually my first experience very close to birds other than I, I have friends who have like pet parakeets and, and stuff like that. But uh, no, definitely the first time. Yeah, so uh, what was that experience like for you? I mean, that was, that was my follow-up question. Karina kind of touched on it. Uh, but, but for you, what was that like? Uh, well, at first I was terrified because I didn't want to hurt the bird. And also, birds uh, birds are spiteful creatures. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, they, they are. They will get mad and they like to bite. And even when you decide to let them go, Sometimes they will stay in your hand just to bite you. <laughs> and that was honestly really incredible because I got to realize that these are creatures with <laughs> very specific rage, uh, but a range of emotions and, and feelings. And really they, I don't know, I, I got to learn a lot about the, the behavior of, of things that don't like to be held. Well, in some of these birds, it's like you never would see anywhere else, like the uh, towhee with those red eyes and the lazuli bunting, the just the bright blue. Just there, there's some amazing birds at Cedar Point. Yeah, and so uh, that was something that became sort of really part of our class. Sort of like every morning, we'd all just like gather around the banding table. Um, this time I'm sort of designing that to be sort of um, more involved um, with the course. But again, it's just this idea of constantly building on, you know, sort of, you know, experientially or like physically like engaging, you know, with the stuff we're going to we're going to read about. Um, so well, the final thing I, I sort of wanted to ask uh, both of you um, again, as this course is something we're trying to grow in the English department, making use of the the opportunity to have classes out, out at Cedar Point. Um, if you had to make an elevator pitch about why students should consider taking a literature course out at Cedar Point, um, you know, rather than on city campus here, what would you say to them? Um, you'll get a lot more out of a, this course, specifically literature and the environment out at Cedar Point, just because you're completely immersed in the literature and the environment. Um, it's such a unique experience. There's challenges involved, but it's worth it. 
And especially as a UNL student, you should definitely take advantage of the opportunity because not just anybody can go stay at Cedar Point. So it's kind of a special thing. So I would say do it. And this literature and the environment course, especially because a lot of my cabin mates who were in like life, um, life bio class, they were pretty much jealous of me the whole time because I got to kind of have more freedom of where I'm reading and things like that. So having a fine arts class out there, I think, is ideal. Mm. Uh, sort of my pitch would be, you like reading? You like writing? You like hiking? You like birds? You got two weeks? Take this class. It's it's the perfect class for people who like to, to learn about the environment and do real work out there. Uh, and it's only two weeks. So really, there's no reason not to take this class. Well said, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Karina. And thank you, Ben, uh, for doing this. Students want to find out more about Cedar Point Biological Station or the courses we've been discussing. Uh, they can find more information at cedarpoint.unl.edu. Uh, the class will be held this summer from May 17th to 30th. Special thanks to Corey Willard and his students. Plain Stand is produced by Robert Lipscomb, post-production by Stephen Ramsey, music by Shadows on a River. My name is Mitchell Evans. On behalf of the Department of English at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, thank you for listening to the Plain State podcast, tagline forthcoming.